Hey, what's up, Detroit Altar? God bless you and welcome back to Detroit Altar Online. My name is Sydney Stewart and I'm the lead pastor here. And today we're going to be wrapping up the fourth and final message in the Peaceful House series. I hope that you have learned and have gained from this series as much as, as I have. God has been so good to me through this series. This is one that's really going to stick with me truly for the rest of my life. Um, it's been a pleasure kind of walking through some of the Proverbs, just very, very basic Proverbs and just kind of expanding and expounding on them and, and sharing, uh, again, what God has taught me through them with you. We're going to be looking at another proverb today, um, but before we do, I want to just, um, I want to open up in prayer because I think that's uh, the best thing that we can do right now. I am really excited to share this message with you. And my hope is that um, you're excited to hear it. So with that being said, Lord, we just thank you. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you so much, God, for your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you for the Holy Spirit. I thank you for the peaceful house, Lord. If there are any viewers right now, Father, that are, are struggling to find peace in their lives, oh God, that are struggling to find peace in their households, Lord, I ask, oh God, that you would be with them today, that you would rest on their hearts, Lord, that you would give them the holy quietness that your spirit brings with it. The holy quietness that only the Holy Spirit can bring. God, I thank you. And I ask that you would help my lips today, help my tongue, oh God, help my mouth communicate, Lord, help my heart and my mind communicate this message as you have communicated it to me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So like I said, we've been looking at the Proverbs and um, uh, the Proverbs really are just common sense, but it's common sense that's not so common. I almost liken it to, um, it's, it's like one of those things where Let's say you had a bag of Reese's Pieces and you ate half of them, but you knew you had half a bag left, right? And so you left them on your desk and the next day you come down to your desk and you're kind of just doing your work and you remember, oh snap, I got these Reese's Pieces here. So you look on your desk and you're looking around and you don't see them. So then you go in your kitchen because you really, really like Reese's Pieces, right? So you go in the kitchen, you open up every cupboard and you can't find it. Now you're getting upset. You open up the refrigerator and you scream out to your wife. You're like, yo, babe, did you move these Reese's Pieces? What's the deal? And she's like, no, I didn't move the Reese's Pieces. Then she goes down to your office or your room or wherever you are working. She looks on your desk and there they are. The Reese's Pieces are sitting right there. And it's almost like, you're like, babe, you, you just put those there, didn't you? No, I didn't put them there. Like, and you like, how did I miss them? They were sitting right there in front of my face. How in the world did I miss them? And in a way, even though that's a really silly analogy, in a way, that's kind of like how the Proverbs are. You see, we can read through the Proverbs 50 times and miss a simple truth that's been staring us in the face the whole time. So my hope is, is it, like we've only been looking at very short verses but we've taken a long time to unpack those verses because there's so much in each and every proverb. And my hope is that, and we're going to talk about this a little bit more today. My hope is that you're meditating on these words, that you're storing them up in your heart like we talked about last week, that you're really digging deep into each truth because the truth is staring you in the face. The Bible says that wisdom cries out, it calls out, okay? But the common sense nature of the scriptures is not so common in our world today. And so what we're going to look at today is, again, we're going to unpack another truth. And today we're going to look at Proverbs 17 and 1. And it's very simple, but it speaks volumes. OK, it says better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting. 
with strife. Better is a little bit of piece of bread and it's crust like a crusty piece of bread. God, the Bible is saying that it's better to have a little bit of bread, moldy old crusty bread, but to have peace in your home, to have a holy peace in your home, praise God, than to have a house full of feasting with strife. Now, what we're really saying in this, and I'm going to give you the points up front because I want you to, to really internalize these points. I want you to capture, I want you to have to guess what they are as I'm going through the message. I want you to get them up front, write them down, recite them, meditate on them, think about them, and then apply them. And the points are as follows. One, the peaceful house chooses spiritual delicacies over natural pleasures. Say that one more time. The peaceful house chooses spiritual delicacies over natural pleasures. Number two, the peaceful house chooses spiritual sanity over worldly possessions. Spiritual sanity over worldly possessions. And three, the peaceful house chooses the quietness of God over the fruitless noise of culture. Peaceful house chooses the quietness of God over the fruitless noise of culture. What the Bible is saying in this verse is powerful and it's actually very simple. He's saying it doesn't matter how much of the natural you have. That's not the important part of this equation that he's building for us, okay? I'm a bit of a nerd, so I look at everything kind of syllogistically, like from the perspective of an equation, x plus y equals z. And so with this equation, right, if you humor me for a moment and just kind of walk down with me in, in this diagram that I've kind of created in my mind, it's basically like you have uh, this dry crust, on one side of the equation, and you have a house full of feasting on the other side of the equation. And then you have the peace of God, peace and quiet, right, on one side of the equation, and then you have strife on the other side of the equation. And so what he's saying is, he's not comparing people who have a lot of peace and feasting, right, with people who have no peace and a dry crust. That would be silly. He's not saying that. He's not taking the best of both worlds and comparing it to the least of both worlds. He's saying, you know, for most of us, the vast majority of us, the 80% of the world, what we're going to have to choose on a daily basis is in, is in the, the milieu or the medium, the middle ground, that gray area. It's do we want to choose the house full of feasting, which may come with strife, or do we want to choose maybe um, the dry crust? which could essentially be the source of our peace and quiet. Now, the dry crust isn't the source of the peace and quiet. Let me not, let me not confuse you. The dry crust is the decision that we make that is in alignment with the scriptures that chooses the spiritual delicacies of this world over the natural, which results in the peace and quiet. You see the difference? You see, what's, what happens is we have to choose on a daily basis. Every single person, every single day gets the opportunity to choose. Do I want to go the spiritual route or do I want to go the natural route? And this is, again, a very simple truth, but it's very, very difficult a lot of times to apply to our lives. The question is simple. Are you going to feed what your spirit needs? Or are you going to feed what your flesh desires? Are you going to feed what your spirit craves for? What it needs to survive? Or with that 15, 20 minutes on your lunch break, are you going to feed what your flesh desires? That's the question. That's the million dollar question that we all have to answer. And we all do answer in one way or another every single day. We choose 
if we're going to choose the, if, if, if we're going to take on, right, another 20 minutes, another 30 minutes of scrolling through Instagram, or if we're going to take on, right, use that 30 minutes to actually walk through our scriptures, to pick out a verse, to, to memorize a verse, to meditate on that verse, and to collect it as we talked about last week in our hearts. We choose whether we're going to gossip and take the, 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 the gossip that we just heard and spew it to another person, or if we're going to listen in, in to, an, to, to our friend and as they're gossiping, say, nope, not trying to hear that. Not do, hey, ah, ah, I see where you're going. I don't want to hear that. That's the question. That's choosing, right, the peace of God over the noise of this culture. The noise of the cult, the culture wants you to gossip. It wants you to get the tea and spread the tea around or it, it, that's what it wants you to do. But the, the Bible is telling us, listen, if you want my peace, if you want my holy quietness, you got to choose something that might be a little bit more difficult. And in the natural, it may feel like because you're not getting the, the gossip or you're not giving the gossip or maybe you're losing friends or whatever the case may be, right? In the natural, it's like, man, this really feels like a dry crust right now. All my friends left me. It really feels like a dry crust right now because I can't seem to uh, find anyone that I can, I can really go deep with. It may seem like the dry crust, but the Bible is saying, listen, that's okay. It's okay. Listen, it's okay to have the dry crust if you know you're going to have peace and quiet. Who better to talk about the house full of feasting with strife than our dear friend, King Solomon, the very writer of this proverb. Who's better to talk about this than him? You see, Solomon, the one who wrote this, is telling you it's better to have less with peace. The one who had the, he was the wealthiest person in the world. He had the most money in the world. He's saying, listen, I've been there. I've done that. Okay. If you got peace right now and you only got a dry crust and you're thinking about going and getting a little bit more because you want to please your friends or because you want to look good to other people. If you're thinking about going and getting more because you want to drive a nicer car and you want to do these things. He's like, listen, I've been there. Don't do it. It's better to have your peace with a little dry crust than to have everything that I have and end up you end up like me. What does that mean? Let me read to you a little bit about King Solomon. Some of this I didn't even know. I'm sure I've read it before, but I was re researching this and I'm like, man, that was crazy. That brother's life was wild. Look, check this out. He said when, when, when Solomon was very young, his older half-brother Amnon sexually abused his half-sister Tamar. Two years later, Tamar's full brother Absalom murdered Amnon and fled into exile. After three years, Absalom's great uncle Joab persuaded David to let Absalom return. Two years later, Absalom sent servants to burn Joab's field. Wow, that's crazy. That's kind of messed up, right? So that Joab would help him be fully reconciled with the king. Joab did that. Absalom began scheming in earnest and soon carried out a successful coup d'etat against his father David. This brother is wild. Let's keep going. This is all in Solomon and David's family, right? Now David fled into exile. David's on the run. King David is on the run because of this brother. He's on the run. In the civil war that followed, Joab kills Absalom. David replaced, David was replaced, uh, I'm sorry, David replaced General Joab with Absalom's General Amasa, but Uncle Joab killed cousin Amasa. Just before Solomon became king, Adonijah, another half-brother, tried his own coup d'etat but failed when David suddenly made Solomon king. Solomon, the son of a king, a king, the son of a king, right? These, these people were powerful, the most powerful people in Israel, okay? Powerful. And yet all of this is going on. Wealth 
And yet all of this is going on. I didn't even tell you about Rehoboam and what happens and how the kingdom splits. And like, we don't even have to go there. All we have to do is look at uh, uh, King David. And I didn't even talk about King David's sin because that's probably primarily where it all stemmed from. You see, when you let sin into your household, chaos ensues. And so think about it like this, right? We're looking at uh, all this stuff that Absalom did and Joab did and Kudataz and people trying to overthrow the, 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 um, the kingdom and all of that, right? And we, for me, at least, my mind goes back to David's sin with Bathsheba. And if you don't know the story, go back and read it. But basically, David commits adultery and he, calls, he causes a woman to commit adultery. And then after he does this, he gets her pregnant. And he, after he impregnates her, he has his, her husband uh, Uriah killed on the battlefield. And so that was really kind of the inception, if you will, of a lot of strife that entered in that family's home. And so that strife that enters that family's home turned that family upside down. It changed the course of the nation of Israel. If all he had to do, all David had to do, if all he if, if all he would have done was just turn his eyes the other way, go back to his dry crust, if you will, what he perceived to be dry crust in the natural, right? The woman, the women that he had, he didn't want. He wanted that woman, somebody else's wife. He had to go and get quote unquote, a house full of feasting. He had to go and get more than what he had. He wanted more in the natural. He chose the natural things over spiritual delicacies. The Bible says that King David was a man after God's own heart. So to hear that he had he'd done this was crazy to me when I first read this. It was wild to me. But even David, at some point, chose Natural pleasures over spiritual delicacies. He chose the fruitless noise of the world over the quietness of God. And if Solomon were here today, I think that he would say exactly what he said thousands of years ago. And that is better to have a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. The book of Ecclesiastes says it this way, better one hand with tranquility than two hands with toil and chasing after the wind. This can even be looked at from a financial perspective, not just gaining right women or gaining uh, popularity or gaining power, but also from a financial perspective. You see me personally, um, I've always had this mentality. It's actually written on my like uh, statement of, of, of truth for how me and my wife and my family, how we're going to operate our finances. Better one hand with tranquility than two hands with toil and chasing after the wind. That means, listen, if, if I have the opportunity to have um, three cars and a house here and a vacation house there and uh, uh, a timeshare down here in, 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 you know, in Fiji or whatever, if I have the opportunity to have all of that, but the result from that is that I'm going to be toiling and chasing after the wind, I don't want it. I don't want it. Okay? I've always told myself that. I said, listen, babe, if I have an opportunity to go further, um, and you might think this is crazy, again, to the natural, to the world, what I'm saying is wild, but this is a biblical truth. It's common sense that eludes people. It basically, for me, it was like, yo, babe, like if I have a chance to get a, a higher position or make, you know, extra X amount of money, X amount of thousands of dollars, but I foresee that it's not going to allow me to go to church on Tuesday night for Tuesday night prayers. If I foresee that it's going to potentially not allow me to really um, read my Bible as much or see my family as much or see my kids as much, or if I feel like it's driving me crazy and it's giving me stress, then I'm not taking it. I'm not taking it. 
Doesn't matter how much money. I don't want the two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. I'd rather have the one handful and I can come home and kiss you goodnight. I can come home and, and kiss my kids goodnight with tranquility and the quietness of God. And that has been a staple in my family. And I would hope that you would adopt that as well. But the world doesn't see that. The world can't see it that way. Let's keep going because there's another family. You see, a lot of times people, right, they look at the stories in the Bible and first off, they second guess whether they're true or not. This was a true story. OK, there's quite a bit of documentation, both um, biblical and obviously secular or non-biblical that points to uh, this taking place. However, a lot of times people look at the families in the Bible and they're like, well, I don't know, that doesn't really look like any families that we have today. It doesn't, I can't really equate that to what it is that I'm seeing in modern day times, right? Well, actually you can, because there's one family, and I'm sure all of us know them, that really is the uh, prototype, right, or the the, 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 the exact image of the family of David's family and Solomon's family and Bathsheba's family from thousands of years ago. And you're like, well, who was that? Okay. Well, it's the Kardashians. I'm not a big follower of the Kardashians. I actually had to do a lot of research. I know who they are, obviously. Um, you know, I'm, I keep up with some of what's going on in their lives, but I had to do a little bit more research to figure out uh, everything that was going on. And there was a laundry list of things, but let me just kind of walk you through a few things, right? Again, we're talking about a house full of feasting with strife, okay? Now listen to this. You're like, well, how in the world is David's family um, similar to, to the Kardashians? Well, check this out. Car the Kardashians' total net worth combines to over $2 billion. They're extremely wealthy. Solomon, as we've already articulated, has an innumerable amount of wealth. A great, 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 great amount of wealth. Wealth like nobody has ever seen. More money than Elon Musk, more money than Bezos, more money. They, he was super wealthy. Okay. So Kardashian's wealthy. Our dear friend Solomon and his father, David, were wealthy. Then you've got the Kardashian families or family has over 200 million followers on Instagram. Probably if they're on Twitter, millions of followers there too. Facebook, millions there too. People love their shows. They get the craziest, greatest ratings on, the, on their television shows. I mean, people follow them, right? Whatever they do, people want it. Okay, they lead the industry, Kanye, right? He's not a Kardashian, but he's married into that family. He leads the music industry. And then you've got uh, the other one who leads the modeling and fashion industry. And then you've got one of them who leads the LGBT community. I mean, they're leaders in their own right in a lot of ways. People follow them. And then you look at David and Solomon, where they were the leaders of an entire nation. The whole nation of Israel, they led them. And they were powerful in their own right. Probably the most powerful family, if not the, one of the most powerful families on the world, in the world at that time. And so there are some striking similarities between these two families. And we already talked about King David and Absalom and Joab and Solomon and all those things and Bathsheba and what they've done. And now we have to look at the Kardashian family. Let me just run this over. And this is not, let me be clear, this is not to poke fun at them. In fact, I'm praying right now, Jesus, Lord God, Holy Spirit, go to the Kardashian family and, and lift them up. They're going through a lot of things right now, Lord. Show them your will. Show them your way. I'm actively praying for that family. That sounds crazy, but it's true. Okay, and there's a 99.99% chance that they'll never see this. But I'm, if they ever do, I'm praying for you. Just like I'm praying for all of our families, for all of our households. But here's the deal. I have to tell you this because it is important. It is an important depiction of what this verse is saying. Lamar Odom had an affair on Chloe. Rob Kardashian and Black China's 
baby mama, daddy, best friend, sibling drama going on, right? Then there's Tristan Thompson cheats on Chloe while she was nine months pregnant. Kim and Kanye at this point had a potential divorce. It sounds like as of today or yesterday or two days ago, they are have actively filed for divorce. I think Kim actively filed for divorce. This will be her third divorce. One of her marriages actually only lasted 70, so 72, 75 days or something like that. Three divorces. Kanye was hospitalized for mental illness. Kanye runs for president. Lamar Odom, near fatal overdose. Bruce Jenner, becoming a woman. I mean, come on, let's talk. Like, I, there's so many things that I could name and I'm not, again, not trying to poke fun at them. I'm telling you this because they have a house full of feasting from every angle you look at. Financially, popularity, leaders in their own industry, in their own right, they, are, they have a house full of feasting and yet, Although America looks up to them as the poster children for what all things that we should be, the reality is their family is falling apart. It's better to have a dry crust. A dry crust. I mean, listen, you guys. You're like, well, no, you, don't, you just, no, listen, it's better to not be popular, if popularity is gonna bring you hell, basically. It's better to not be rich if richness, if wealth is gonna bring you hell, if it's gonna tear your family apart, if it's gonna cause you not to be able to trust your sister or your father or your daughter or your brother. Why can't people understand this? The peaceful house chooses spiritual delicacies over natural pleasures. It chooses spiritual sanity over natural possessions. And it chooses the quietness of God, the quietness of God. The quietness of God over the noise of this world, the, the noise of culture. I mean, let's really think about that. Like for me, as I was reading this, I was like, Lord, there's a verse and I couldn't think of the verse and then it popped into my mind. It was like, okay, this is the verse that I have to wrap up this message with and this is the final point in the message. So stick with me, okay? We're talking about the quietness of God. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be made known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. Present your request to God. Let them be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts. The peace of God will guard your hearts through Christ Jesus. Listen, the peace of God will guard your heart when you pray, when you supplicate, when you beg when you give thanksgiving, when you present your request to God, then the peace of God will rest on your heart. But the first word in that entire scripture is rejoice, rejoice, rejoice. Rejoice. That's how you get the peace of God in your homes. That's how anxiety leaves. That's how anxiety leaves. Listen to this, okay? When I was, um, I don't, <laughs> I don't really struggle with anxiety, but I've had a moment of, of great anxiety a couple of years back and it changed the way I thought about this idea, about, about anxiousness, about depression, about anxiety. Okay, it, changed, it allowed me to empathize with people who do before that experience, I probably couldn't, but now I can. You see, when I was a, um, not a kid, when I was, I had just taken a test, or actually I was in the middle of taking a test um, for a certification, and um, I had studied for this test for hours and hours and hours, and I knew the material like the back of my hand. And I never used to really have test anxiety, but for some reason, I think it was, oh, this is why. <laughs> it was um, 
a, this was like the last day that you could take this test. So there were like two days left when you could take this test. And I've been putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go get this, this certification. So this is the last day. And then the test would change and it would become a, a, a higher version. But bottom line is there was pressure to pass this exam. And so I'm like, cool, calm and collected. I go into the test and I'm like, man, I know I studied and I'm starting to take the exam. I'm like, man, this test is a little bit harder than I thought it was going to be. A little bit harder. Okay. These questions ain't looking too familiar. And so I'm going through the question. I'm like, man, I don't know if I got that one right. I'm getting down to question 50 or 60 or whatever it was. I'm like, snap, I'm not sure how I did on this exam. And then I go back through and I start to change some answers and I make some stuff around. I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm still not feeling too good. And then about, I want to say, uh, with five minutes left in the exam, I'm on the last question and I keep going back from B to C, from B to C, from B to C. I'm like, this might be C, it might be B, it might be C, it might be B. And I'm sitting there like, oh, snap, this is like, and I'm like going back and forth in my mind. And then there's four and a half minutes left. And I'm like, man. And then I start to have like a somewhat of a panic attack. And I'm like, man, I'm like freaking out on this thing. And I'm like going B to C, no, it's C. Because, because I remember when they took this and it was this algorithm. This is the, no, it's C, no, it's B. And then, and then you guys, that was the, the most stressful, most anxious five minutes of my life. And it went down to 30 seconds and 10 seconds. And I watched it in the last 10 seconds. I chose it from B to C. And then for three seconds left, I went back to B. And then I hit submit. And then it said, congratulations, you passed the exam. And I was like, awesome, cool, whoo. And I'm still sweating. And I'm like, man, that was rough. And I look at the score. And it was a 72%. I think you needed a 70 to pass. And then I start to kind of be like, man, like, okay. And then I start to look like I'm calculating the amount of questions versus like how many you have to get right versus wrong in order to get 70%. And I'm like, I only passed that test by one question. And I'm starting to think like, oh snap, like maybe that B to C, when I went from C back to B, maybe that was the, 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 determining factor for me passing this exam and not having to study for a whole new test and I started to rejoice I started to rejoice and I started to rejoice and I started to thank God and I was like God thank you and I realized when I got home that it I was anxious 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 all the way until I began to rejoice even after I passed the test even after I saw that I said, congratulations, you passed the test, I was still anxious until I re realized, I was like, yo, like, I was like, I passed and, and I was only one question away. I rejoiced and I thanked God and it was crazy because that was only five minutes for me. But some people live in anxiety every minute of every single day. And I began to think to myself, that could be hell. If you walk around thinking it's B, it's A. No, it's metaphorically it's B. No, it's, it's kind of A. No, it could be C. And there are voices talking to you and telling you this, that. No, 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 this is. And that's, it's internal strife. And the Bible is saying, if you want peace, rejoice. Rejoice. And then the peace of God. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind. And then it also says, finally, brothers, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, Meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. I just realized this for the first time as I was reading this verse. That first paragraph says rejoice. 
and the peace of God will be with you. The second verse says, meditate and the God of peace will be with you. We need both. We need the peace of God to guard our hearts and then we need the God of peace to walk with us. We need both, literally. We need both. If we want a peaceful house, if we want the quietness of God, we have to choose the spiritual things over the natural things. We have to choose God over self. And then we have to rejoice in it. And lastly, after we rejoice, we have to meditate on his word. So I'll leave you with that. The peaceful house has both. The peaceful house has the peace of God and the peace of peaceful house has the God of peace. You really can't have one without the other.